Hello, hello, hello. I'm going to give this um, for Zoom to catch up and to admit everybody. And I think we should be by now on Facebook Live as well. A good amount of you here. It looks like there's 35, 36 in the Zoom, probably some more on Facebook. Welcome. Happy Friday. Thanks for uh, taking your Friday afternoon or evening and spending it with us. All right, 401. Looks like most people are are here. Uh, let's get let's get started. So welcome. This is uh, I guess last uh, programmed event or, or or highly programmed event of our uh, Spirit of A Aviation Week or Oshkosh Week of programming. Welcome to Oshkosh, by the way. I'm not sure why none of you are here with me. It's uh it's kind of lonely uh, at our booth, empty as you can see. Uh, so you know this is. EAA is a really neat thing this week where they've uh, put together a whole bunch of virtual events of their own. They're running free live streams uh, all day, every day. If you haven't seen those, check them out at EAA, EAA together. Uh, we did one of their, their forums on Tuesday where we're about dying on certified. And we, we've done a whole week of, of live events. Uh, this is what we call our virtual booth uh, Skyview HDX demonstration. And what this is, is sort of as, as if you'd come up to, to one of us uh, staffing uh, the Dynon booth and said, hey, I'm interested in Skyview. Um, you, know, show, you know, show me everything about it. And so this is a little bit demonstration, a little bit like advertisement, and a little bit, you know, teaching tutorial. And, uh, you know, uh, at the rest of the week, we also, uh, I, guess, I guess this is the last one this week. Tomorrow, same time, 4 o'clock, we have a happy hour which is going to be casual. A bunch of us from Dine On will be, and we hope to see some of you. We'll have our drinks in hand, and uh, we'll just talk aviation, avionics, and, and uh, you know, kind of in a more casual way. So the way this works is that uh, all that are in Zoom, you're muted, and you can't unmute yourself, and that's just so that, we, you know, it's down. Uh, but what we, what we will do is stop every now and again, and, of course, at the end of the sessions, and there are a few ways for you to ask a question. One is to hand in Zoom. To do that, you click the participant on a computer, and then there's a, or the, the, it's a raise your hand, it's under the participants button, and the thing at the bottom of the screen. And if you uh, type a question instead, whether you're on Zoom chat, if you don't have a mic, or if you just prefer to type, you can, uh, under the chat button on Zoom, also, if you're on Facebook Live, there is a comment stream underneath the video, and you can ask questions there. And what we do when you ask a question in Zoom, if you raise your hand, we will uh, ask you to unmute yourself. You'll get prompt on your screen or device, and you can uh, you know, talk using voice. I have a couple of folks uh, helping me. They'll be answering questions uh, via the Zoom chat and Facebook chat while I'm uh, talking and demonstrating the panel. We have uh, Kyle George. He's uh, one of my colleagues from our sales team. And we've got Jeff Weiser. He's, uh, he's, he's one of the folks on our, our marketing team. And I'm Mike Schofield. Uh, I head up the marketing team. And, uh, and just a bit about me. I, uh, long time Dinonian. I've been here for 15 years, uh, private pilot. I have a glass air sportsman. I'm not sure if it's, is it in this, uh, it's not in this background. Uh, I share a glass air sportsman with a, a bunch of other people also at Dynon. And so that's my sort of Dynon and aviation uh, credentials, if you will. Uh, if you do have questions, try to keep them to the topics uh, that, we, that we're talking about as we go. Uh, we're gonna go through the whole system. And if there's something that is about a piece of the system we haven't talked about yet, hold that until we get there or, or, or until the end. And I guess with that, we'll jump right into uh, the display. So this is uh, Skyview HDX. And uh, let's see, is the video working? There it is, perfect. Uh, so I have a panel here. This is a, uh, you know, technically a Dynon certified panel. So it's a kind of a, a representative of a bonanza. But it's really the same. All the software feature the features are the same, whether you are flying behind an experimental light sport or a certified aircraft. 
And if you were to walk up and say, hey, show me Skyview HDX, I'm likely to say, uh, well, let me show you, you know, first of all, you know, in a minute or two, show you how everything works. Actually, even before that, you know, what is Skyview HDX? I mean, it's really everything, right? So it's, it's, it's a, a screen or two or three that is your flight instruments, your engine instruments, your map, flight planning, navigation, autopilot, transponder, comm radio, ADSB in, ADSB out, traffic and or ADSB in traffic and weather, ADSB out, 2020 compliant, uh, Modas transponder comes along with that. You know, that's the that's the capabilities, and we'll dive into them. Uh, so it's really everything that you might need in in uh, in an aircraft. Of course, we also have other products, which like the Ethos D10A, which is down here, which complements Skyview, which which offers a a, a dissimilar redundant backup flight instrument. Uh, set of flight instruments. So if you walked up and said, hey, show me Skyview uh, that it does, uh, let me just show you how to use it in just a couple of minutes. So Skyview HDX is a touch screen. And, uh, you know, so we can do, you know, things that, you know, should be obvious that, you know, now, now that we all have mapping on our, our phones and, and iPads, we touch things are going to, you know, happen. If we touch the autopilot area, things are going to pop up when we get a menu with, uh, say, autopilot controls here, or similarly, transponder. So if you touch the screen, you're going to get something that you, you probably expect. We also have a full set of buttons and knobs. So the buttons and two concentric knobs. Kind of coming from right to left, the rightmost button is going to bring up messages and alerts. So here it's telling us to check our altimeter setting. Uh, it's saying that we're, we're, our, our compass isn't calibrated. This is your alert area. This button may flash uh, message caution, which is yellow, or uh, warning, which is red, depending on what's going on uh, with the system and, and the systems in your aircraft. Everything that changes the display is under the dis display button. So if you press the display button, you'll get a menu. This will let us do things like bring up the engine monitor as a half screen display, or the map as a half screen display, or we can make the primary flight instruments full screen, or off uh, what we call here the map info column, which are some numerical widgets uh, that go with the uh, map. We can turn that on and off so I can make the primary flight display, display even bigger. And then we can go a little deeper and we can do things like turn off the engine bottom band. So if I just wanted a a full with synthetic, all of that information is under the display button, or all those options are under the display button. So I'll just uh, pull everything back onto our, oops, not that, that, and map. So this is sort of the all-in-one display where we have every, and we can, and we can uh, through uh, more more button pushing, we can swap what things are. We could even swap what's on this screen in front of me versus what's over on the co-pilot side. All of that's super customizable. So everything about changing the way things look is under the display button. Everything about all of the options and preferences on using the equipment and the different features is, is under the menu. So we pull up the menu button and you'll see left to right, autopilot, transponder, timers, comms. Curiously, that also is the same uh, you know, order as if we look at what we call the top bar up at the top of the screen, we've got autopilot, transponder, uh, timers or clock and then comm radio. So if I wanna bring up autopilot, I can go, let's go back to, to nothing. I can press menu and then autopilot, just touching that. And now I have the autopilot menu or I can X out of that. And instead, as I mentioned before, the, the touch screen is touchable. So all of these things along the top of the screen, if I just touch them, if I touch the autopilot area, I'll get that same autopilot menu. Going back to the to the the menu menu, so this controls all of the major items: transponder, timers, and comm radio. And then we have all kinds of preferences for different systems within Skyview. So, for example, the PFD, we can go to PFD tools, and this is going to let us configure how this works. Maybe I want to turn off synthetic vision. Maybe I want to uh, change the six-pack mode where we get the the, the legacy instruments. All of that's under the 
the menu. Same thing for map, map layers, weather, all of these things that are like map, orient, map oriented in terms of how we want the map to work and look. Uh, that's all under the menu here. There's one more way to do things in general, and that is, you know, we do have a touch screen and touch screens are super powerful, but in turbulence, if you have your outstretched arm, uh, you know, on a screen, we do have uh, you know, this nice, it's hard to see in this lighting, but this 45 degree angle bezel that I can literally grab and anchor myself to. So that helps in turbulence. And also along the side, there are uh, kind of uh, uh, inset rails that you can anchor yourself with as well. But we do have these buttons and knobs, and so you can use them in turbulence uh, for almost everything you can do with touch. So again, if I bring up the menu and then use this, uh, this right knob, I can scroll through these options. So if I want to go to autopilot, I, you know, I scroll with the knob and then click it. And now I can turn on and off and adjust all, all the things that I can do with touch with, with the knob. So I can turn on autopilot, for example, by just pressing the knob and press it again to turn it off. So that's, that's the, the key way that you navigate Skyview. Oops, let's turn everything off here. Also, and we'll get into this a little bit later, the left, left portion of the, the, the buttons don't change much. We've got flight plan, info, nearest, and direct to. And these are, of course, all map-oriented things and navigation-oriented things. So on the right side, it's about you know, controlling the screen, the display, and the different features within Skyview. And then as we kind of go left, this is all kind of tied to the map. So a couple other things that you'd, that you'd need to know. So that, that kind of gets you around Skyview. There are a bunch of things that you're going to adjust often, right? Whether you're flying autopilot or just reminding yourself uh, while you're flying. And that is your different bugs. So you've got your, your heading bugs, your altitude bugs. And so the, the knob that's closest to the primary flight display is going to control all of those, those values, including and in addition to the altimeter setting. So there's a couple of ways to adjust them. One is you'll see that this says heading. And if I turn the knob, it's going to adjust our heading. You can see that little cyan bug it just moved with my, with my scroll. If I click this instead, now I get a menu of all the different things that I could adjust, like altimeter setting or course or altitude, vertical speed, indicated airspeed. So I'll just bring up another one. So let's say indicated airspeed. And then we'll just uh, rotate that. And you can see that cyan bug is uh, moving and also the above the airspeed tape. You can see that as well. So you can use that knob to, uh, and, you know, click that knob to change the function. And uh, similarly, if you have a map up, the knob closest to that is going to rotate in and out. It's going to zoom in and out. And if you're not in front of the airplane, clicking that will, you know, move you uh, back to the airplane. The other thing you can do, again, so we talked about like there's hard controls, which I just showed you for the knob. We can also uh, change the knob function using touch. So if I want to, for example, change the altimeter setting, well, we just touch that on the screen. And you can see that just lit up. It says Barrow now. And now we're adjusting the altimeter. If I want to adjust heading, just tap that. You can see it just went to heading. And, um, and now we're adjusting heading. So that's basically all of Skyview HDX's controls. With that you know, few minute tutorial, you basically now know how to get to everything in Skyview. We'll, we'll get into what all of those things are, but just knowing those few things, how to get into the various menus, how to use the knobs and buttons and, and how touch generally works, you've got an, enough knowledge to, to get started. And so now what we're gonna do is just go through each feature area um, and talk about them, talk about them a bit. Let me um, first just turn on my synthetic vision and get us back to, to square one. All right, so primary flight instruments. And what I'll do is I will just make this a little bit larger. So here is your primary flight display. It does everything that your conventional six pack would do and more. And just going you know, right around the screen, so we've got Airspeed, which has a tape, and that tape has uh, your different 
V speeds, which are color coded like they would be. Here's your, your flap extended speed. Uh, one nice thing about having a, a digital instrument is we can tell you where VY and VX are. You can see there's a little Y and X there. Uh, down to your dirty, your, your, your stall speeds and your, and your, and your, uh, your, your clean and dirty stall speeds, all in, the, all in the way you'd expect. We have outside air temperature, which is over here. And because we have outside air temperature, we could also tell you what true air speed is. That's right below the airspeed tape. GS is, is uh, GPS or ground speed. And so that will be different than your true air speed by whatever your wind is. Because we know all of that information, we know what direction you're pointed, we know how fast you're going over the ground, we can actually just tell you what the wind is. So even though this tells you, you know, true air speed versus ground speed, we could also tell you that the wind's you know, five knots on the nose and that there's no crosswind right now. So coming across, this is our attitude indicator. It's, uh, it works sort of how you'd expect. Got tick marks 10, 20, 30, 45, so we're at a 30 degree bank right now. You've got a pitch ladder uh, that, is, uh, that is marked. And then those, those little cyan uh, arrows are telling you the bank angle at which you would need to be at to complete a, a standard rate turn or your, your two minute turn. So that'll change with airspeed. So if I speed up by changing the airspeed, you can see these, these are kind of moving away. So put the, put the little yellow arrow on the cyan arrow and you'll be making a standard rate you know, turn as, as they'd want you to do for IFR. There's a few different ways you can uh, display the, you know, the, the aircraft zero pitch line. Uh, that's configurable, I won't do that here. And then so uh, in addition to your attitude, we have the other instruments that, that, are, that are useful. You got your slip skid ball, which is up top here. And then we have uh, turn rate. So turn rate is right above the compass. And as I turn, you're gonna see it just kind of pop. You're gonna see this magenta bar. And you may not be able to see, but there are two tick marks and the second tick mark is a standard rate turn. So there's kind of two ways to, to know that you're doing a standard rate turn. One is using the cyan markers and another is using the magenta bars. So it's attitude, turn rate, slip skid ball, it's kind of all of your you know, quote unquote gyro instruments. We also have uh, an HSI or a, a DG, it's kind of all, all in one. What's nice about this is because, it's, because we have digital sensors and we know both we are measuring the Earth's magnetic field, uh, but we also are sensing movement of the aircraft with all of the rate sensors and accelerometers inside of our Atahars. And that means that this is magnetic heading, but it's also stabilized. So you can think of it as a, you know, a, a gyro stabilized compass. Um, you never need to adjust it. You never need to grab, uh, you, know, a, you know, like with a tra traditional DG, you, can, you need to adjust it every now and again. You don't need to do that with modern KIFAS instrumentation. And not only is it a DG, but we can put overlay information on it. It's an HSI as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. Moving along uh, to the right, we have our al altimeter tape. We've got altitude. That's the, um, the Colesman window or the altimeter setting. Again, because we have outside air temperature, we can tell you what your density altitude is. So useful for your performance uh, calculations, although you know, most home builds don't really have a problem with that, but there it is. Uh, I guess I've mentioned already, but above each of the tapes, there is the bug. So if I adjust the bug, you'll see that's the bugged value. And again, the altimeter setting, if I were to adjust that, it changes there and then the, the, al the altitude will scroll. Vertical speed is off on the, off on the right here. So here now we're affecting a, a 700 foot per minute climb. So that little flag moves up and down the scale. And then kind of coming back down here, we already talked about the, 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 the DG and, and the HSI a bit. You know, there's the, the current heading. This is our heading bug. So if I were to move the bug and say, I want, you know, 170, so now I've changed the heading to 170. In this kind of demo mode, it's always going to chase the bug, so you can see the heading is moving to capture that bug. On the right here, we have our HSI information area. If I tap that, it's saying uh, it's looking at Skyview. There's nothing programmed into Skyview. I'll just very quickly just direct to anywhere, somewhere, anywhere. Now it's, it says we're going to an airport 30 miles away, and we're on course, and we're a little bit off of. Uh, 
now we're now we're flying towards that airport. If I had so this is using uh, right now Skyview's internal flight plan. If I were to tap it again, if I have a, a third party navigator, perhaps an Avidyne 440 or a Garmin GPS 175, we can connect in with that and then we can show its guidance. Similarly, if you have a compatible nav radio to show VORs, ILSs, localizers, we can show that as well. And with some devices, we can even tell you it'll decode uh, uh, using the, uh, the, some devices can decode the Morse and then show you, uh, you'll always see the frequency, but you can, some of them will show you the identifier that it's, that it's decoded using the audio. Things like the SL30 and the GTR, I think the GTR 225 or, or the 255 will do that as well. So that's the, the primary flight display in a nutshell. Uh, I guess I'll talk just a little bit about the HSI. We touched on it. I guess we already talked about the HSI. So, you know, if I, uh, if I bring up, let's say here a VOR and then I adjust the course, I can touch that, which activates the course and the knob. I can rotate that and then we can, for example, you know, see what radial we're on, on this VOR. If I press and hold the course, it'll sync to center it. So right now where it says we're on the, you know, the 222 radial, that's the, that's the course that we've centered. So that kind of wraps up. Oh, I'll show a couple other things. So under the primary flight display tools, there are a few things that we can turn on and off. There's a G meter, for example, if you're flying aerobatics. Some of the, you can do a wide view or a narrow view, uh, which you know you can see more of your side versus, uh, your side view versus in front of you. You can also see that, adjust, that, that affects the pitch ladder. So this is a max five degrees here, but it's a max 10 if you're, if you're zoomed out in wide view. You can turn on and off synthetic vision. And for those of you that haven't really flown behind glass, you might be saying, well, um, this, this EFIS display, I don't, I don't really know about that. So we have a, what we call the six pack mode where all of your instruments look and behave in the way that you're used to. So what a lot of people will do is they'll start with six pack mode and then you'll self train, meaning that you just use this until you say, okay, let me go try out. It's just a couple button presses away, go PFD and turn off six pack. And now you have your EFIS display. And then maybe you get a little more comfortable and then you you decide to pull in the synthetic vision. So now what you see out the window matches what you see on the screen. One more thing that's a part of the primary flight instrument instrumentation suite is the angle of attack if you install the AOA pedo. This is showing kind of like a moderate cruise where it's 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 kind of full and you're seeing a lot of green as AOA in increases this bar erases so that you go, go from green, then only yellow is left. Uh, but frankly, I don't use the on-screen version that much because there is an audible output. Skyview has a really robust, robust alerting system that uh, will talk to you. And in the case of AOA, it beeps. And it has a progressive style beep. And one of these presentations, I'm going to remember to get a recording of it. Um, but it starts out beep, 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 beep. And as you, as you, you know, continue from your your pre-flare into your, your deeper flare, it's kind of like a Geiger counter at speed, you know, as if you're getting closer to the radioactive material, it, it's, it speeds up faster and faster, beep, 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 until right uh, before the stall, you just get a solid tone. Uh, so it's kind of, it kind of become, becomes a fun game to, to land with, you know, no residual AOA available and no energy left in the wind, you know, right as your, as your wheels are touching. It's uh, your primary flight display. Um, are there any questions about the PFD that have bubbled up that we want to answer? Otherwise, I'll I'll uh, I'll move on to the engine monitoring. Hey, Mike, it might uh, it might be a good idea to uh, give something away at this time. Oh yeah, you know what? Give me just a second. I I totally forgot about that, so I need to get my. Uh... And while he's uh, doing that, if anyone has questions or wants to raise their hand under the participants tab, we can answer those while he's getting that pulled up. Oh, I see one already. Hang on, Greg. Okay, can you hear me? Got you five by five. Okay, um, so I see on the, uh, where you dial up the course uh, window and, and find out what your bearing is when the CDI, but I don't see a bearing mm. needle. Does it display a bearing needle? Yes. It does, yes. <clears throat> so you, you can have whatever your primary HSI source, then you can have two additional bearing pointers. And so that would be the double arrow and the single arrow? Correct. Green and the blue, or the cyan and the green? 
Yeah. yeah so, so in current software, they're both blue. Uh, it's likely that we'll change that. It used to be that they were different colors, and then for certification reasons, they made us make, made them not the same color, but not not yellow and red uh, because those are traditionally alert colors. Uh, so right now they're both blue. But so I'll just I'll pop out of here. So right now I've pulled up a bearing to sky and a bearing to GPS two, which is some theoretical external GPS, and you can see that we've got. Uh, I'll just spin the HSI a little bit so you can see the motion. So we've got the green is the actual HSI in this case. It could also be different colors. It could be cyan or magenta, depending on the source. Radios are green and GPSs are magenta is sort of the, the, is the scheme here. So this is Skyview's GPS. It's magenta, some third-party GPS, some, you know, connected GPS too. And here's a nav radio. And so uh, just to, for the best clarity, I'll show like here's a GPS and then so here's the course information. And then the two bearing needles are... Very good. Um, it's got the single flag, that's Skyview, and then, yes, yeah, so there's your bearing needles. And on this one that you're looking at right here, is that a, uh, a ILS glide slope indicator just to the right? It is, yeah. So that'll pop up if you have either uh, an ILS uh, glide slope or if you have a glide path coming from a GPS navigator that's doing, uh, you know, an LPV or an LNAV plus V, anything with vertical guidance will show up here. And also Skyview now has a couple of different ways to give you uh, guidance to a runway using uh, programmable factors. It will give you either an angled, um, it'll give you an, an angled glide path to either a runway or to the airport. It doesn't do terrain avoiding, just so, just, you know, for any of you that are, that have Skyview and already and are using that, just know that when you do that, it'll give you an angle, but it won't, it'll fly you uh, right through any terrain in front of you. So you need to, you know, uh, be cognizant of that. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. All right, so let's give away, uh, let's see, what did we do last time? I think uh, the first one was a $50 Aircraft Spruce gift card. And the way that the giveaway works is you pick a number between one and 100 and you throw it into the chat. So do that now, one per person. If you've won before, uh, you, know, you don't get to win again or if you, or whatnot, you can do it in the Facebook chat as well. Uh, we'll, we'll We'll wait a few minutes or a few seconds to let Facebook catch up because they're running 10 or 15 seconds behind us. And then uh, the drawing rules are price is right rules. So uh, closest without going over. And if there's a tie, well, if there's a couple of you, then you both win. And if it's more than that, then I know we do a, a, a draw off or something like that. We make it up as we go along here. All right, so there's... I'm going to share my screen. And here comes the wheel spin. All right, here we go. Mike, we got a, a winner on Facebook. All right. So if we let's see if we have any winners in. Uh, um, so close, iPhone five. No winners in Zoom chat. I got two twenty eights, but no twenty nines. All yeah, right. We got our twenty nine on on uh, Facebook. I'll okay. get his information. Uh, okay. Sounds good. And so I guess from here we'll just jump back in and. Let's see, spotlight the panel again, and we'll move on to engine monitoring. So engine monitoring on Skyview HDX is usually if along the bottom band here. There are actually three different ways, three different pages that you can configure, and they're all completely configurable, so we can move things around kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch um, in setup mode. I'll just super briefly just demonstrate that before I talk about the engine monitor. So setup mode kind of is a super easy to navigate. I'm just going to do it quicker and not even explain it. But if I were to uh, just grab, let's say, uh, uh, oil temperature, it's a little, you can sort of etch a sketching it around. I can change the style, make it a, a bar or an arc, make it bigger or smaller. So a lot of configurability here. And there are, there's the bottom band, which is what you see here. One, dis one display, the, the way that you'll, you'll use it the most. So bring up using that display button, we call the 50% age, <clears throat> which augments 
with uh, with that, whatever you want. We have it set up with fuel computer and separate EGTs and CHTs and some aircraft stuff like flaps and trim. We can also uh, do full screen engine monitoring. If you have a second screen and you want it to be just an engine monitor or wanted to install Skyview as an engine monitor, you can do that as well. It's actually quite affordable. And so you can set up the 100% page to show engine monitoring. And let's see, so I'll bring, go back to the regular view. So what do we have? We have everything essentially. We've got uh, manifold pressure, tank, RPM, fuel flow, also fuel quantity. So we've got two here, but you can measure more, more tanks if you'd like. When you have fuel flow, that enables the whole fuel computer. So we, we showed all of these, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Fuel pressure, oil pressure, oil temperature, all of your CHTs and EGTs, we can monitor uh, four, six, even nine. We can use a second engine monitoring module to, to monitor uh, a ton of CHTs and EGTs. Bat battery volts, amps, some aircraft information like trim. We can do three axes of twin tr trim, so elevator, aileron, and rudder if you have it. Flaps, this is showing zero to 20, but you can calibrate that to your aircraft. If it'll show whatever your aircraft can do, including retro flex flaps if you have them. And then some other interesting things, since we're you know, a computer, we can tell you, this is something that we do uniquely. We can tell you whether you're, this is for continentals and light homings that, that are, are not exotic, let's put it that way. So nothing with uh, crazy pistons or, or, or turbocharged, but uh, lean of peak, rich of peak, or at peak, we can tell you, uh, even without being in a lean mode, so we just know all the time we're using the, the tables from the, the, the chart plus some software magic. Percent power, I don't know if I have it on here, but we can also tell you the number of horsepower you're running. You got tack and Hobbs time, part of the fuel computer. Let me pull up the, the larger display here. So the fuel computer, we can tell you how many gallons remaining. So in this demo mode right now, it's not configured so well. We have 106 gallons remaining. We've used nine gallons of flight. Uh, because we know GPS, we can tell you uh, how many miles per get you're getting and how many gallons you'll have at your waypoint. A whole bunch of other timers there. And the way the fuel computer works is, you, you know, there's a, there's a sensor, a fuel flow sensor, which intercepts all of the fuel that's ending up in your engine. You tell uh, the system, your starting state. So you say, hey, I, fill, I filled up. So there's a button for full and it says, oh, add 136 gallons because we're neg in negative territory. And then it adds, you know, gets us to our full whatever you set. You could also set a preset, which might be near full. Uh, if you have tabs or uh, it's in my, in my sportsman, full fuel, so I normally fly it with 30 and leave the tip tanks empty unless you're going cross country. And then Skyview does one better than that. Since we have the intake sensors, your resistive or capacitive sensors, when you fill up between legs of your flight, you fire Skyview back and say, oh, wait, hold on. I think you need to adjust your fuel computer fuel quantity. Uh, and then it'll offer it to match what it senses in the tank, or you can use full or preset buttons. Those of you that are setting up your engine monitor, uh, this 50% screen, or in fact, any of the other screens like autopilot or the comm radio or transponder, that uh, that might show up, they will take up half the screen. And so when you're setting up and the system kind of prompts you through this, but when you're making this bottom band, you want to keep your primary content, the stuff that you, you know, that you want to see all of the time on the left side. You can also make it the right side, but on, on this side. And, and, and when you're in the setup, in the page setup, it'll say, hey, all your important stuff goes here. And then when we erase that, or when we go back to full screen, you get the rest of that band, which here is your EGTs and CHTs, or if I go to the percent page, EGTs by themselves, CHTs by themselves, a couple of other random things, the fuel computer, all of this is super configurable. Um, it doesn't need to look like this. You can have, you know, you can double up all of your, you can have, uh, you know, a bigger version of your, you can have one big tachometer if you wanted, for example. So that's engine monitoring in a nutshell. Uh, Kyle, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Things that I've glossed over? Um, I don't think so, Mike. I think you covered those things pretty well. 
um, you know, efficiency and calculations, as well as tank level monitoring, sort of the two aspects to fuel. Um, it does them both. Okay. Looks like we got a question from Scott Johnson. Scott, I'm going to hit your ask to a mute button. Okay, hopefully you can hear me this time. Can you hear me? Barely. How about now? Uh, better. That sounded better. All right. There you uh, are. Are you going to go over the uh, the audibles and how that's configured? Are those automatic or is that something we have to set up manually in the, in the HDX? You're talking about oh, audible like, alerts? Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you can choose whether they're on screen, audible, or both. Uh, they're they're going to come defaulted, I think, mostly on. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think they come mostly on, and then you can turn off the ones that you're not using or you, know, you don't want to hear. Uh, there's also an engine inhibitor so that if you've booted the display up before engine start, you're not getting blown up with flashing bells because there's no oil pressure, no RPM and such. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's, um, everything's configurable. Um, the audibles are for, for things that are common that every, every airplane you know, practically has, uh, like oil pressure, oil temperature. There are voice alerts that are pre-programmed, you know, oil temperature high, you know, uh, you know fuel quantity low, that kind of stuff. And then for it's more generic, the audible will be something like, I think it says engine monitor. Things that aren't engine, will just say, you know, warning. And then I'll just go real quickly, spotlight the panel again. Real quickly, a whiz into setup, and then we go to engine monitor, and we just go to any particular sensor. I'll just pick a fuel pressure. So here's your alarm options. It could be self-clearing or latching. Uh, which, mean, which means uh, a latching alarm is one that sticks around even after the event's gone away, uh, so, that, so, that you, so that you've definitely seen it in the alert area behind that button eight. And then makes you, you acknowledge it. Your, yeah, makes you acknowledge it. And then here are all of your different ranges, your red ranges, your yellow. You can have you know, all kinds of different colors. You can have them in illogical orders if you want. If you have, for example, if you have uh, a caution range uh, on your engine, you know, it's uh, like a 50 or 100 RPM range that that you're not supposed to be in, you can make that yellow, you can interrupt your green to have a, a yellow band in there. So all that's super configurable. Let's see, we've got a uh, question. So that was, was you, Scott? Yeah, Scott, you just you just talked. I just sent Noel and unmute. Yep, awesome. Yeah, I just had a, a couple questions on the engine monitoring. Uh, is there a way to display gear positions uh, is there a lean assist function? And I'm assuming it records, is the, the sample rate uh, programmable? Yes, uh, gear position can be done, whether it's just a single uh, to trigger the you know, speed-based alerts or whether you've got a nose left, right, and an in-transit light. Um, then let's see, your other question was lean assist. Yes, it does have lean assist. Um, which will give you what's called, I think, your GAMI spread, the difference in fuel flow from when the first to the last cylinder peaked. And then it'll sh tell you whether you're rich of that, lean of that, both by flow and by temperature when you're in the leaning mode. Um, remind me what your third question was. Uh, it was the, I'm assuming all of the data is recorded data rate. and it the is. sample rate. You can configure sample rates. I think the fastest is 16 recordings per second. The slowest is once every five seconds or 10 seconds or something like that. So there, it'll tell you how much time you will get of recording based on the sample rate. Awesome, thanks. And one, re and one really neat thing, I'll, I'll demonstrate the, um, the, uh, the lean assist. Uh, let's see, spotlighting the video, okay. So under everything controlling things is under menu. So menu engine tools lean. It's actually hard to really demonstrate it. Yeah, actually. So it says it's in lean. And then what it would do is your EGT values would, would uh, go from being the, the numbers once they peak to showing you one, two, three, four, which, the order which they peak. And then instead of showing the absolute value of the number, minus 20, minus 30, which, which means like how much cooler than peak it is. And that's useful when you're kind of figuring out, like, you know, uh, you know which is your hottest cylinder, which one peaks. Uh, uh, first and last, if you've read the, you know, John Deacon's Avweb columns um, or Mike Bush's uh, stuff, you know, there's, there's definitely some awesome resources out there on like how to run Lean of Peak, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will. Uh, but whatever, whatever church of Peak, if you're a Richard Peak or Lean of Peak guy, uh, once, once you have 
once you've done that sort of that initial kind of research of like how does my engine run and how which cylinders are hottest and coolest, uh, you're you're not going to lose that lose that lean mode. Once you have everything tuned, you're always telling you whether you're lean of peak, rich of peak, or peak in real time, and and your percent. So you know, for me, up at altitude, you reconfigure for cruise, you do the big pull with your, you know, I'm looking for 65, 70 percent of power. I'm on the lean side, the end. Um, and then watching this, like I, I truly uh, don't ever really use manifold pressure. I'm just looking uh, for for my percent power most of the time. That's not that's an absolute statement, but like I'm using the percent power more than I'm using manifold pressure and almost never lean assist mode. All right. Is next on our list. Uh, HSI. We already talked about HSI. Well, yeah, and, and we and we mean that uh, that it connects to other devices, the air rank. So I'm actually not going to go into that. In the next thing. Oh, the next thing is mapping. I'm not going to go super deep into mapping because we're already 40 minutes in. Uh, even after this week is over, we've been doing events once every, you know, week to two weeks, depending on uh, schedule. We're going to keep coming uh, coming back for a while. And uh, we want to connect with you. So uh, at the end, uh, um, if you have a thought for what top you want to see, you know, in depth in a live event like this, uh, let, we, we uh, please suggest them. So keep those in mind. So uh, I'm going to reconfigure our display to show a full screen map. Uh, is that enough? No, nope. we're going to get rid of the engine. So here's a full screen map. And let me just reset just to get us near. And of course, that resets my this as well. All right. So here's a map. We have uh, everything you'd expect on a map. So one, of course, pinch to zoom, zoom in, zoom out works exactly how to expect it would. We can whip across the country uh, super quick. And uh, everything is. And a whole bunch of obstacles right now. The obstacles on the display are dynamic. They will show up uh, when you are when they are a factor. But even though we're nowhere near Newark Airport right now, uh, the obstacles if we were near would be a factor. And you can see they're erasing from the screen as we're climbing. In the terrain, you can see there's terrain moving. The yellow apron here that's kind of gradually receding, also going away as we as we climb. If we want information about something, we just touch it. So Newark Airport, here's sick information. But the airport isn't the only thing that is, you know, in the, that I touch, there's also some air spaces in this case. So if I touch this little arrow, we're gonna get some Bravo. So this, this is the, the ring right around Newark. So it's surfaced to 7,000. If I go, uh, uh, this is, there's a whole bunch of air spaces here. So I'm just gonna pick a, like a more complicated place kind of near uh, Essex. Uh, so if um, here's Caldwell's class D, but there's other airspace because we've got, you know, different shelves. If I just hit the arrow, you can see like, oh, there's a class B that's 1800 to 7000 I need to worry about as well. It's all that's in that spot that I just touched. If I want to bring up information about that place or a place, so Newark Airport, here's where we talked about some of those buttons earlier. So the inf info button will bring up information about, in this case, Newark Airport. Basic information is under the airport. We've got the comm frequencies, plates, or airport diagrams. So we've got, for example, the Seattle Avionics airport diagram, we've got the official FAA airport diagram for, for those that, that the FAA has cataloged. Uh, if there, we have ADSB in, we have the weather for that. You'll get the METARs, you'll get the TAFs, they're all decoded. You can show them encoded as well if you just want to make your life hard, but uh, if there's a nearest winds aloft, which isn't uh, in because I'm far away, isn't here. Runway information and remarks. This is all of the information out of the green uh, airport facilities directory that I don't know if any of us buy anymore. If I wanted to go direct to, I could just go direct to. And now if I zoom way out on the map, which again, you can do either way, we can do uh, the pinch to zoom or I could just use the, the knob. We're now going from Seattle to Newark. Going to take a while to get there. On the info column on uh, on the map info items, there are uh, ten slots here. There's more than ten things, so you get to choose what shows up here. 
we got 2,000 miles to go. It's going to take 24 hours to get there at our current speed, um, our, uh, our distance to waypoint, what that waypoint is, all kinds of other information. We can uh, touch the, 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 the north, the, the arrow here. So right now we're track up or up. We could also be track up. So if I want to, so again, track up, north up right now, or we can change the track up. So if I actually want to get to New that you see I grabbing bug, which is what you would do under autopilot, or just if you just want to note where you want to go. And uh, now we're heading to, to Newark in a day of, of flying. So some other information on the map page, if we zoom in. So you can see actually one thing that we're seeing when we're zoomed way out, you can see there's kind of like this purple fringe around the continental US. And what you're seeing is the, the, the radar from ADSB. So I'll zoom in just a bit more. So there are some places where ADSB doesn't have coverage or at least didn't have coverage when we took the recording that's in our demo file. And so you can see over the mountains, this, this purple fringe here and also of course over the ocean is where there just isn't cover. And then the actual weather is brighter um, returns. So the terrain is kind of this more muted color, your red and yellow, your, um, your weather is brighter. And we can animate that. And uh, oh, also with weather, when you have the weather turned on, you can optionally turn on, you can see the airports are coded. So Payne Field here is, is green. Arlington, but if we go over uh, where some of this weather is, where's, a, where's an airport that's got weather here? Oh yeah, here out on the coast, we've got this airport that's uh, far. IFR coded red. So, and again, we can touch something and just say, using the direct to button, boom, we're navigating to it now. You can follow that with autopilot or just, or just visual. Another kind of neat, uh, just to run along the, the buttons here, quickly. nearest brings you nearest to whatever you're near or where you're near. So if I just touch this area and I say, hey, the nearest airport, uh, forks, and then that, uh, the airport that was IFR, which is just over here, that's this guy here. Uh, we've got uh, nearest airports, but not just nearest airports, we could do nearest weather. And this is good to figure out you know, where your VFR and IFR uh, your airports are, just for getting a quick lay of the land nearest VORs, NDBs, fixes, user waypoints. We helpfully tell you where Dynon is. Um, we are in a populated area, so please no dropping anything on Dynon. <laughs> uh, ATC, frequencies, flight service stations, all of those are under the nearest button. Flight plan, since we just did a direct to, there's only one thing in here we can add things a bunch of different ways. I can just pick Port Angeles and say add the flight plan. There's a button for that. Add it to the bottom or I could add it above. And I've just quickly made a flight plan. There's a bunch of different ways to make flight plans and edit them. If you have a third party device uh, like an Avidyne or a Garmin IFR Navigator, there'll be another tab showing its flight plan. You can have it display on the map as well. And frankly, for the you know 80% of your missions uh, that are going to be VFR, you're gonna find Skyview's mapping to be a whole lot easier to use. Um, let's see, we went nearest, uh, direct to, you can, you can touch something and say direct to, you could also just press direct to and either type in something, you know, grab a random identifier using the keyboard and say direct to and, and now there's a, a direct to go in there. There are a bunch of different options under the menu, under the map controls for map layers. We can turn off the topography. If you don't really care about terrain, to turn off the terrain alerting. If you really just care about airspace, for example. So like now we have a, a much cleaner view. We can even turn off um, weather, get rid of everything. And so now we have, you know, uh, just air, airports and airspace, uh, a lot cleaner. So we could see CAC or paint field airspace. So it just cleans it up a lot. Uh, similarly, uh, we have, uh, this costs 99 bucks a year from our partners at Seattle Avionics. You get all of your sectionals. So the, the paper charts, if you will. Similarly, we have um, IFR low and high. So IFR low, IFR high. I already showed you the plates. They're all geo as well. So um, 
turn all that off, go back to where we were. If I go to, let's just say, an, a near airport diagram, or actually it's not going to be close enough, an approach. Here's an approach plate and it's geo-referenced. You can see that the airport, we're flying off of the approach plate off to the right side here. That's the airplane flying over it. And all of those charts, sectionals, IF far low high airport dimes and what's really neat they have the all of the uh, the uh, the the company's now gone away but the the flight guide diagrams those little black books of uh, you know the, the binder diagrams which is i think 5000 ish airports most of the airports in the US those are all geo referenced and all in here as well and that's $99 a year uh, even without that all of the digital data you know so just just the map at large if you will all this airspace all the airports um, all of that is freely downloadable from our website. We update it every 28 days. We make it available about a week before as well, the upcoming cycle so that you can throw it on a USB stick. And just a tip, especially if you're doing the charts and I recommend getting the, the charts because they're super useful, uh, buy two USB memory sticks. You can get like small chiclet size sticks that, are, uh, that, that a bunch of companies make for you know, 10, $15 on Amazon. Buy two for each display. You leave one in the display uh, or connected to either if you have a lot of people will do a you know the USB ports that are panel mounted or if you just uh, have a, a harness tucked up behind your panel leave one connected to it because it needs to be connected for uh, not the digital data not the map data but that those charts the paper charts they actually take up a lot of space so they stay on the USB memory stick we, we read them off whenever you call them up and then what you do is you have one at home which you're loading the next cycle and then you just do a swap right so memory sticks per display one to have in the display, one to have at home to load up your upcoming data is, um, is what I do anyway. That kind of covers the mapping. Um, any questions on that before we move on to next things? Mike, there was a question about outside US charts. My comment on that. Yeah, so, the, so there are charts available from uh, pocket FMS, and that's also where if you live outside the US where you would get digital data as well. And they have charts for uh, uh, definitely Germany and, and it varies by country, uh, what, what, what countries charts are available for. Digital data uh, is available, uh, pocket FMS is I think 149 euros that converts to dollars differently depending on how, and they run sales as the as Seattle Avion. Um, so there are different ways to, uh, um, to to get that data. Also, digital data is available from Jeppesen uh, uh, worldwide. You know, um, the pocket FMS data tends to be, tends to have, if you're outside of the U.S., tends to have more of the, the smaller airports, like grass fields and private fields that, you know, people have put in uh, to the database versus the Jeppesen, which is a little bit more commercially oriented. That's not actually true, but that's... Um, that's uh, what customers have come to find. Also, the pocket FMS uh, is more affordable in terms of the, the data. The one, you know, if there are any Canadians, we unfortunately don't currently have um, Canadian charts available in terms of like the EFR charts and IFR charts, but uh, that's something that we uh, would like to, to resolve. But there is, there is digital data, meaning like the mapping data available for Canada, either through pocket FMS or, or Jeppesen. Good question. All right, I'm gonna move on to, uh, let's see the comm radio. So the comm radio is, let me just, uh, oh, let's stop it, thanks. So the comm radio, so you can, you, so the comm radio is uh, this, this top bar here, or let me just adjust the, and also this control panel here. So if we touch the screen, Here's the comm radio uh, interface digitally. And all of those are on these buttons here. The really novel thing, kind of like the evolutionary thing about radio is it really changes the way you interact with your radio. So traditionally, your dual hey, case Mike, knobs. Mike, not to interrupt, but maybe pull the half page radio up again. Your video is kind of cutting in and out a little bit. So maybe leave that up for people to see for a second. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so everything that's on, on the control panel itself is so on 
uh, you know, the, the page via the buttons. Obviously, there's there this has a knob, and then here you would type the frequencies. That's the the number difference is, is that versus that. So conventionally with a radio, you know, you're given a frequency, or you look it up, and you use your your two, your big knob and your little knob, which the, again the lighting isn't showing so well here, but there's kind of a dual concentric knob, and then you you press the flip flop. Um, but with Skyview, and so now I've taken my standby and I've moved it to my active. But with Skyview, you'll almost never do that. What you're going to do instead is press the airport button. And now you can see it says nearest airport on the screen. It's got a list of them. And then we just kind of grab, we just scroll through, you know, what airport we're interested in. Um, uh, we're interested in. So let's just say it's, uh, you know, Arlington, for example. Say that's the nearest airport. That's an airport near Seattle. And now that I've got the airport loaded in, I've got these four buttons. And one is ATIS, and they'll, they'll bring up ATIS, or in this case, AWOS, because it's not a controlled airport. And then I just click the button, and I flip flop the AWOS in. And then as I'm uh, getting you know, closer, I'm going to go talk to uh, you know, uh, CTAF, or, or Multicom in this case. And there's my frequency, and then I flip flop. If there were a ground frequency, and I pressed ground, it would up the ground. Uh, there is no ground in this case, so it just says no ground. Uh, and, and any other ATC frequency, air traffic control related frequency, uh, departure and approach in particular, those are which are which are kind of assigned, or at least there are ones that are associated with airports, those are in here as well. And so you can fly, you know, so I can fly, if, if I had flown to Oshkosh this, this week, I would basically, as I'm flying along, just be like, oh, what's the nearest airport? Load it up. What's the tower? I just want to listen and see what's going on around me. And good to go. And there's really no other comm radio like that, you know, so you literally never tune frequencies manually again. There, there are other ways to, to pull up frequencies, you know, we can just pull up the airport and then go to comm frequency and touch the frequency and then shoot it over to the, the radio. So I just sent a, a frequency over. Um, I can also go to the airport and send the whole airport over to the comm radio. So I'm sending the airport to the comm right now, which just loaded the that whole airport in. And now those buttons work here, as I was showing before. Or, uh, as Kyle mentioned, the, the page, same thing here. I could just say, OK, what's the ground frequency for paint? We just load it up. What's the, the tower frequency? We just load it up. Departure approach. If you have multiple towers, so paint has uh, different towers for left and right runway, as we just keep touching that button, whether it's here or on the physical knob. Um, it, it does that. And then here you have a swap button, which is the same as clicking the knob there. We've also got dual watch, which uh, lets you listen to your standby frequency. Uh, so uh, so your, your, your primary still takes precedence. So it's almost like having two comm radios. You're only able to transmit on the primary. And if there's anything coming over the primary, it's going to win. But if, uh, let's say you're, you've got a a, a quiet frequency, but you want to listen to the weather ahead of time, you can do that and it'll, you can listen to your ATIS or AWOS, but still hear the common, you know, the traffic that's coming, that's around you. And you could also, um, you can open up and monitor by uh, pressing and holding, or just by pressing the volume knob. It says uh, RX squelch, which means you just hear static or a, you know, weak, a weak distant ATIS or whatever you're trying to hear. That's the comm radio in a nutshell. Any questions on comm radio? Don't have any in the chat, but let's see if anyone's raising their hand. Doesn't look like it at this time. Okay. Um, well, somebody had a great question. I'm just looking at this, a couple of the chat questions. Can you, when you land, does it switch to the airport map for taxiing? Um, Going back to the map for a second. That's a, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it doesn't do it automatically, but if you press and hold the map knob when you're on the ground, it'll show you the airport diagram for it. Uh, if you've already called up a uh, a plate, so let's grab a real quickly a plate or a chart. So an approach plate, uh, pressing and holding the that will bring you back and forth between those two things. I, I'm on the airport, so it's gonna, it's actually, uh, it's grabbing the airport diagram. But if you were just flying along, uh, not right on top of the airport, which, which is what we are, it would, it would go back and forth between the map and the last, uh, the last recalled uh, chart. All right, 
Next up on the list is the transponder and ADSB in and out. Uh, pretty simple, actually. So, just uh, adjust real quick, bring it up a little bit better. All right, transponder. That's that's it there. Uh, two ways to get to it. You can touch it, or if we X that out, we can go to menu transponder. There's a button for squawking VFR, and that's configurable because it's 1200 here and not 1200 uh, in Europe. You got your ident, you've got your your buttons for discrete code. So six five six seven. Now we're squawking. We ident. There are also buttons for the different modes, but and it's not showing because this is configured. Uh, differently, uh, I guess, for uh, a, a particular application. But there's also an auto mode where it will tran uh, uh, transfer between ground mode and out mode automatically uh, using, using Skyview's knowledge of whether or not it's in flight. So most of the time, you know, if I'm not on flight following or on a flight plan, uh, I don't even think about the transponder. I mean, it's in my checklist and I make sure it's, you know, it's, it's on and, and, it, and says ground or out. But it automatically you know, changes, so no more, no more of those kind of like, you know, helpful. Uh, I'm not seeing your transponder calls from from ATC. Those just don't exist when you're flying behind Skyview. That's the transponder. Um, ADSB in and out. So your transponder is also, if 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 you'd like it to be, and we recommend it because it's pretty affordable. Your ADSB out, your 2020 compliant ADSB out source, and. Along with that, uh, it's not in the transponder, it's a separate module you know, behind the scenes, but ADSP traffic and weather in. We've kind of shown that already with the, the map. I'll just recap it real quick. So the weather is graphically shown on the map, your, uh, your, your radar. And then under the airport information, you have, uh, where you have you, under nearest, sorry, let me go back. Under nearest, we have nearest weather. And if we drive into any weather report, you'll get the details for that and that's, um, that's all. Um, that's all your details. Oh, here's um. Uh, we we're talking about winds aloft. Here's uh, the nearest winds aloft for SeaTac uh, in this case. And one neat feature. Actually, I'll, I'll do that in the context of this of this next product, which is the the knob control panel. So this is one of these optional components uh, that has. Three knobs. The things you most. Know. Tell you want to talk about this. You have a, a fun way of talking about it, and I'll and I'll I'll be your hands. Oh, Kyle's gone. So I guess that's a no. All right. I'll. Uh, so Kyle likes to say this is kind of like the, the the keyboard and mouse. So these are the three things that you're likely that, you know to adjust the most um, when you're when you're flying. Let me just get a, a display up here that makes sense. All right. So when we're when we're flying along. We do have the knobs uh, down at the bottom of the screen that can adjust all of these things, the altimeter, the barrow setting, and the heading. But especially if you, if you have autopilot, you're going to adjust your heading or track, and you're going to adjust your altimeter setting, and you're going to adjust your altitude a lot. So having a, a box that, that has dedicated knobs for that, even though touching the display to adjust the knob is real easy, it's always nice to have dedicated controls for things. So that's what this is. If you if you press and hold, or if you uh, if we press the heading or track knob, uh, it'll sync with the current. Same thing with out. If I press it, it syncs with the current. You can see that cyan uh, bug just dropped in, and uh, the bug just changed. And then the altimeter setting is a cool one. So if I if I press that, you see it just says KPAE. It didn't say it, it, it stopped pr producing a number for just a moment. And that'll do one of two things. If you're in flight and you have ADSB weather, it's going to use the ADSB weather report, right? That's going to be your most current weather setting. So as you're flying along, so similar with the comm radio, we're just saying like, you know, what's the nearest uh, airport and go grab the, the CTAF or the tower just to listen. Every now and again, you can just say, hey, set the altimeter setting, and it'll just grab the nearest weather station. If you're on the ground, and in most places on the ground, you're not going to have ADSB uh, weather. Uh, it will sync to the airport elevation because it knows you're on an airport. We have all the information about that airport. So it'll adjust the altimeter setting to match the current elevation. And that'll get you uh, close enough. 
and it'll generally match uh, your your you know ASOS within you know a hundredth or two. So that's the SV knob panel, pretty affordable. I think it's two hundred fifty. Um, it's completely optional, and um, and that's that. Next, I'll talk about autopilot. We actually have the autopilot control panel here. I'm not going to do go too deep into the autopilot today other than to kind of give you an overview of all the things it can do. So what we have here is the autopilot control panel. There is an autopilot menu as well. So you can see all of the buttons here, match all of the buttons here. Uh, we can turn on pilot. There's also a flight director, which is, um, just, which is the little magenta, uh, the little magenta uh, bars that you would capture it's, it's showing what the autopilot want, wants to do. So if you don't have the autopilot engaged, but you do have the flight director engaged, you can basically fly as the autopilot by matching the yellow airplane to the magenta bars, the command bars. And then, you know, for, for, your, for your ailerons, uh, you, you can fly in either uh, heading, track, or nav. So heading is magnetic heading. Track is very similar to magnetic heading, but it's not the, heading is where the aircraft is pointed magnetically. Track is where that airplane is going, so according to the GPS. So most of the time, so ATC wants you to fly heading because they do all the wind correction for everybody. They want you to fly heading. Um, but if you're not under ATC control, flying track is a lot easier because you can just say, I want to fly track and then, and then adjust, your, adjust your track knob to, let's say, uh, intercept that airport there you know, uh, Arlington, and now I don't need to think about wind because I said, fly me a track there. And if there's a little bit of wind correction angle it needs to make to fly that track, it will. There's also nav mode, which is fly anything that's on the HSI, whether it's a flight plan approach or just a direct to, that's nav mode. Alt is altitude hold, VNAV is vertical guidance if you have something up on your, on your glide slope or, or glide path. And then with it, when you're flying between altitudes, you can, you know, uh, you know, you have out hold. You could also uh, fly based on vertical speed or indicator speed. Indicator airspeed is great for, for climb outs where you want to fly, let's say, VY or maybe like, you know, VY plus 10 or 15 for cooling. And then you get whatever vertical speed you get. Uh, vertical speed on this is, you know, uh, is useful. Uh, Skyview, one of these widgets you can put on the map info. Uh, info widgets is uh, your vertical speed to, that, you, that you need to get destination. So then flying the vertical speed profile is useful for that. And then nose up or nose down, this is just a quick way to adjust your vertical speed as well. This is, the autopilot also has two modes, the autopilot control panel. And what you see on screen here is what we call expert mode. Very briefly, just going to switch to, um, to what we call simplified mode. And when we're in simplified mode, it, it this is kind of for VFR, uh, you know, of, of, of flying, where it's just there's only two two things: track and alt and HSI and alt. So this is fly direction, fly and altitude, fly the HSI, meaning you know whatever whatever is programmed into your flight plan, and fly in altitude. There's also a yaw damper uh, that's available in both that's YV and, and 180, which will reverse your course if you've accidentally flown into clouds. Let's say as a VFR pilot where you don't intend to do that, and maybe you're not rated, instrument rated, this will get you out of trouble real quick of just reversing. And then of course, I'm not gonna go too deeply into autopilot, but just know that uh, for flying, the simplified mode really takes all any complexity out of it. But if you are IFR and, and need the power or want the power of um, altitudes that are pre-selected and approaches and vertical nav, that's where the the, um, the, the expert mode comes in. The expert mode uh, is also what's reflected on the autopilot control panel. One other thing about this autopilot control panel, it also is, so if you install this, you also get, uh, in, in, instead of installing, let's say the, the relay deck, which you conventionally would, you would you, you hook everything up, including your stick buttons to a different connector on the back of, of the autopilot panel and it handles your trim. And then because it's also connected to Skyview, when you're flying under autopilot, it'll do auto trim. So the servos can, uh, the autopilot servos can sense 
the trim forces just like you can in your hand. And so the, air, the, the, the servos know and Skyview knows that you're out of trim. And when you have this guy and, and, it, and it is able to, to be your trim controller, it'll just blip the trim a little bit at a time to correct for out of trim conditions. Let's say you go from, uh, you know, from cruise to a cruise climb or a descent, it'll gradually um, adjust the trim. You could, also, you could also help it along because it does it very slowly so that you don't have things like trim runaways. Uh, you can also help it along and let's say you just did a major reconfiguration you started as a descent you just give it like a big dose of trim using your your button and then skyview will kind of fine tune it for you what's nice about that is when you disconnect your autopilot uh you're generally in trim because skyview's been helping you along if you don't install to the ap panel this the skyview autopilot panel get uh trim advice right below the autopilot status area it'll basically say trim up trim down and um, and and it'll and and then you give it a little bit of trim, and then you wait a few seconds, and it'll it'll either, it'll go away when you are pretty close to in trim. That's the autopilot. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the intercom because I don't have one here, but you know, so just to talk about other things that <clears throat> that you will need, along with what I have in the panel here. So you know, everything here's a two screen with everything that we've shown today so far. Uh, you're going to need some kind of intercom or audio panel. We like the PS Engineering uh, audio panels. They're super awesome. And then if you're going to fly IFR, you're going to need an IFR navigator. This is an IFB 440. Um, you know, we are admitted, admittedly biased uh, you know, towards uh, Avidyne. It has a great user interface, uh, which, is, which is one reason that we like them a lot. Uh, you were going to go with a, a Garmin GNS, GTN, GPS 175, et cetera. They all work, you know, similarly. And the devices are obviously different, but the way the information comes into Skyview is very much the same. Um, let's see. As I get reconfigured questions on things we've covered uh, there. If you have a question, you can raise your hand in the Zoom. You can also type it out. No current questions in Zoom chat. Let's see. Oh, there was a question from Jeff on is the shear pin in the autopilot servo, servo owner replaceable? It is. Um, they, they, we have made improvements to the shear screw over time. Um, so years ago, the, the ones that were in servos years ago uh, were a little bit prone to uh, fatigue failure. And so uh, we have an updated version of that. Uh, in you know most airplanes, it's not a problem. But we were seeing uh, some of them shear in situations where they where they where they shouldn't have. Uh, so we made a rolling change to that. And it is there are a few different places on the servo. Uh, there's there's kind of like a disc where the, the screw goes through. But basically, if you get in touch with our tech support, they'll send you a form. You fill it out. We send you the screw along with instructions. That I think we send the little tiny tube of Loctite as well, and uh, and you can replace that yourself. Yeah. You do need a torque wrench to uh, reassemble the servo that can do uh, inch pounds, if I recall. And there's a cotter pin as well. Uh, is it a damper button? Uh, Ken's asking. Uh, so there's a there's an on-screen yaw damper button. There isn't one on the autopilot control panel, uh, but there is one under the autopilot menu. So boom, there's yaw damper. And then you can also connect a button, uh, a stick button or a panel button to control that discreetly. By default, when you bring up the autopilot, when you turn it on, the yaw damper goes on with it, and it goes off with it. But you can also turn on the yaw damper by itself if you just want to hand fly, but have uh, have um, Skyview take care of the rudder. Um, there's a private question, which is uh, which I'm happy to answer. Which is, will there be a virtual Skyview to assist with the learning with learning software? There isn't currently, and it's always hard. To, there's a couple of different ways we could do that, whether it's some companion software or in-product software. Don't have anything to talk about right now, but it is something that we think about a lot. Uh, we are doing more and more. Uh, if you go on our, on our YouTube channel, there are uh, a handful, and there's going to be more of tutorial videos uh, that you'll see uh, Kyle in, and those are super helpful as well, as well as uh, these sessions, of course. There are different versions of this exact session you can watch the, the um, you know, the virtual booth visits, and we'll probably do more in-depth things as well. Uh, 
let's see. Next topic here. Yeah, the bits and pieces. So I'll just I'll kind of go behind the panel and just show you some of the things. Anything I haven't covered that we need to cover? Well, throw up your hand or write a, a question. Is there anything like on display that, that you'd like to see? In the meantime, I've lost my, my, my view. So here, here we go. I'm going to go just around the back of the panel and show you the bits and pieces that you need to, or that, that, you'll, that you'll deal with when you, when you install Skyview. So here is uh, behind the scenes. So all of the, so the displays have a 37 pin harness that goes to uh, power and ground and um, it's a bigger harness than this. this is a pared down version for our demo panels. It normally has color coded wires that match what's in the manual. It's your serial, uh, all of your serial devices connect to this 37 pin harness. And then what we have with Skyview that's kind of unique is what we call Skywork. It's, it, it looks like a nine pin serial connector, like your old style nine uh, pin uh, serial ports, but it's not. It's actually a dual redundant power and data network for all of the things that communicate via Skyview network, which are the displays. Um, this is the Adahars in a stack here with the pitot static and angle of attack. The engine monitor is, uh, here's your CHTs and EGTs and all the other sensors. And then here's the ERIC module that would go to your IFR navigator. But the displays connect with all of those things. You can see there's a bunch of those connectors back there. And then all of the panel mounted modules, so this is the autopilot, the, 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 the knob panel, the comm radio, all connect with this common nine pin interface. And you see this, this has two ports so that you can daisy chain them. There's also what we call the Skyview network hub. And this is a pretty representative of like what the back of a panel would look like or could look like if uh, you do it nice and cleanly. And um, we, we pre-manufacture all of these harnesses for you. So you don't even need to build these harnesses. It's gonna save you a ton of time. They come in multiple lengths. The longer lengths come with one connector on and one off so you don't have to pass this, you know, these relatively big connectors through tight spaces. The servos use variants of these harnesses as well uh, because they, they carry more power uh, to them. The power and ground lines need to be uh, direct from shift's power. Uh, but everything connects via Skyview network. What's really neat about Skyview network as well is let's say you do have a wire that's failed or like, you know, you have a, something that's catching on a rib and eventually kind of uh, frays away. Skyview knows how everything's connected and it'll say, oh, uh, a wire just got cut. I'm going to go to the backup Skyview network. You're not going to lose any capability in the aircraft. And we're going to tell you about it. We're going to say, hey, there's a network problem. And then there's a diagnostic uh, screen where you can actually, it helps you figure out which of these harnesses it can help you uh, drill down and figure out uh, where you have your wiring problem. Skyview has an optional backup battery. It's mounted to this tray. By the way, this tray is um, something we came out originally for our certified uh, customers. We're actually working on a revision of it now, but it allows you to stack all of these things that you would often put, including uh, the ADSB module that you'd normally put in the back of the panel here somewhere. So this is a nice way to have it uh, uh, you know, near the display where where your connections are don't need to go very far, and that's available as well. Here's the the transponder and comm radio. Uh, they're not connected. They're just here for the for show. Uh, they both have a, a tray that you mount, and then there's a clip that lets you service it relatively easily. This clips on. I don't think I have that in. Fix that later. Um, so this is all of the, the back end components of Skyview. The displays, as you can see, are not very deep at all. It's like, you know, an inch. Actually need a little bit more with the harnesses and the, and the heat sinks. You'll see that there's uh, heat sinks and fans. We actually don't need the fans. Um, the fans are there to promote longevity of, you know, so electronics in general don't like to be superheated. If you are out in, uh, you know, let's say like the Texas sun and you fire up Skyview, it's going to be really hot. So the fans will help move air. It's also good to have in general good airflow behind your panel anyway. So um, that's the displays themselves. Another thing you can do, uh, you know, so we have harnesses for just about everything now, but if you just don't want to deal with that, or maybe you just don't even want to build a panel, we can do all of that. We have uh, from our advanced flight systems division, we call advanced panels. And an advanced panel is you know, the entire panel, you know, with everything silk screened, labeled, switches, 
And it also includes what's called the advanced control module, which uh, comes with plug and play harnesses. It, it has electronic circuit breakers. It's kind of, um, if you've ever seen uh, the vertical power system, that's, that's electronic circuit breakers and fuse. Then you have to build harnesses for all that. So this is kind of that, plus if you've ever seen the approach fast stack system, that's a good product as well that has, uh, you know, kind of uh, a board with uh, places for all your harnesses. It's kind of those two products. Plus it also incorporates some of Skyview's um, electronics or the Skyview network electronics that's normally a separate module into it's what we call the advanced control module. We send a panel, we send you an advanced control module, a set of harnesses that are ready to plug and play. Um, we have seminars. We actually just did one uh, yesterday was advanced day where we went through the advanced, uh, advanced panel. And if you want to see that, that's archived on our YouTube, our Facebook, or will be on our YouTube soon. It's on our Facebook page. You can watch that seminar and learn more about advanced panel from advanced flight systems. And that could be built with either our Skyview screens or the AF5000 screens. And let's see, with that, uh, for those of you that are have stuck around, uh, we're going to open it up to questions. So if you'd like to ask uh, uh, Kyle or I anything about anything that we've talked about, please uh, raise your hand or type in a question. And uh, and while we're while you guys are thinking up questions, we'll do one more giveaway. So same thing as before, number between one and a hundred. Uh, this time it's going to be for a hundred dollar. Uh, Dynon voucher, so good for $100 to, towards anything you buy from. from and uh, yeah, throw in the your numbers. Bring them well, either. the numbers are already coming in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Either in the Zoom chat or in Facebook chat. You know, I'll go find uh, my wheel of numbers again. While you're doing that, there were uh, at least a couple of questions about intercom and audio panels. Um, how we can get Bluetooth and things like that. So our, our intercom that is currently only available to the experimental crowd is really best set up for just a single radio, kind of your basic single comm VFR two-seat aircraft. If you've got more than two seats or you're trying to switch between multiple comms or mess with Bluetooth, you're going to be a lot better served with any of the audio panels that are out there from you know, Avidyne, PS Engineering, even the GMA products. Um, our, our radio is pretty much universally acceptable by any of those. So you have many options. Uh, there is not a marker beacon indication on the display. Although if you have discrete outputs from your radio, you can set up um, on the engine monitoring page, there are, uh, let me just bring one up real quick. I think he's talking about general purpose inputs. Uh, where yeah. You can configure basically a colored contact light indication, like if a PW heat is on or off or gear is up or down, you could configure that. Um, several audio or uh, IFR navigators come with a, or, or have an option to get a remote enunciator panel. Um, I know Avidyne's at least if the, if the navigator is in a rack that's not in the primary field of view, you actually have to have it. And some of the inner outer middle markers are part of what's indicated on there. So there are, there are other ways to have those indications, but Skyview doesn't have a built-in means. Bob, Bob asks, how much time Ballpark does an advanced, uh, advanced panel save a builder? That's a great question. Uh, so the record is the installation is a weekend, like days. That's a bit that's a bit aggressive. But if you think about, well, so there's kind of a continuum. If you just went with, let's say, some other brand of avionics and built your own harnesses, you're, you, you could have, depending on your skill, hundreds of hours into your wiring and panel installation, you know, where your aircraft takes thousands and hundreds of that is going to be your panel. When you choose Dynon or Advanced, well, we get you part of the way there with all of the harnesses. And so um, you, know, you still need to connect to engine probes and things like that. But a lot of the harnesses are as close to plug and play as we can make them. And then you're kind of, you divide that. And it's hard to give you like a, a hard number, but people are putting in their advanced panels in, in let's say weeks, you know, versus, you know, months uh, of doing your own wiring. So that's probably a good way to, um, to, to frame it without saying it's going to save you, you know, 20, 20 hours, 500 hours, whatever. A lot of that's going to depend on your particular skill. If you give Rob and the team at Advanced a call, um, they can kind of talk you through. Uh, or even if you just go back and watch yesterday's session, it's archived on Facebook, and we'll do more of them live um, with Advanced, of course. Uh, you know, he talks about like these are the these are the four connectors or the four 
bundles of wires that you need to deal with um, when you have an advanced panel versus the, the more that you would need to deal with if you were doing it all yourself and building your own harnesses. So it takes a lot of the mental workload. You know, a lot, most of you aren't electrical engineers and, and uh, maybe super nerds like a lot of us are. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it just simplifies it a lot. Bill in the comments said it saved him six months going with an advanced panel, just for reference. Wow. There you go. All right, so all the numbers are in. I'm going to share my screen again. And all right. That did that pop up? Yep. All right. Here it goes. And again, it's uh we've got closest without going over, prices right rules. Say forty nine. Oh, so without going over. Ah, I, I, <laughs> have to be I say there. a thirty eight, Mike. Thirty eight's the closest I see. Okay. And you've got the the Facebook numbers up too. Yep. Okay. So thirty eight. Uh, is that, that is that in Zoom? Yes, it is. It's Ron. That's right. Ron. Okay, Ron. Jeff's gonna uh, shoot you a message. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And in the in the chat and with that if uh, you guys have any more questions uh, what i'm going to do is there's, there's not a, a ton of you in here and uh, i'm just going to turn on the you can unmute yourself at will if you like so you don't have to wait for us to give you permission anymore and if you just want to uh, ask a question or say hi as we uh, as we wrap up we're happy to stick around for a few more minutes and uh, answer any questions about Skyview, Dion. How's the weather? All right. Ron, I just sent you a message privately. If you, uh, if you can look down there in your, in your chat and uh, see it um, and send me your information, uh, we'll get that right out to you. This question on Thank Zoom. You. There's a question on Zoom. Uh, what's the lead time to have a system, an advanced panel built for you? They quote 12 weeks, the shortest, and they're pretty flexible. Uh, the shortest they've done is, I think, four. Uh, so some of it depends on the back and forth. You know, they really do work with you to customize your, your layout. Like, the more custom, the more, uh, the, the more you want to change, the, the longer that that'll extend it. But uh, 12 weeks is the, is, is the quoted time with variability on either side of that, depending on your situation. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up. Well, thanks for joining us today. And um, we have one last event in the spirit of Aviation Week uh, uh, programming. That's tomorrow. It's a happy hour. It's at the same time, 4 o'clock Pacific. Uh, we'll just, it'll be a little bit more casual. We'll have the avionics if you have any questions, or we're happy to answer any questions that you have. And um, you know, if you if uh, make sure you're signed up for our newsletter as well, that's how we announce things. Uh, if you like us on Facebook, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you have, but if you just uh, if you hit the like or follow button, you'll see the events as we post them, and also as they go live. So when we when we start the Facebook live feed, it'll shoot you a notification on your phone or tablet and say, "Hey, Dynon's gone live," and you can check out uh, the, the the future events like this. And um, yeah, if you want to talk to Kyle about configuring a system, he's available at our sales line. That's 425-402-0433. If you want to shoot me a note with ideas for uh, future programs, I'm at mike at dynonavionics.com. And thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everybody.